Hi, I'm Greg. And I'm Josh. We are students in Mr. Steingass's AP Statistics class at St. Francis de Sales High School. For our AP Stats final project, we decided to create something different. A video parody that is an advertisement for Sprint, showing what the network is really like. This project involved using the speedtest.net and SignalCheck Pro apps on the HTC Desire 816, and each day for 30 days, starting on February 2nd, 2016, measuring Sprint's network speeds, signal strength, type of connection, and quality of signal. Several things were kept constant to ensure that there were no confounding variables. The network was tested at 6.30 a.m. every day and in the same location in Greg's house. The same server was selected for each speed test. Wi-Fi was off and there were no applications running in the background when the tests were conducted. All the data was put into this spreadsheet, which you can see here. The signal strength in decibel milliwatts, the signal to noise, which is basically interference ratio in decibels, the 4G LTE frequency or band, the specific tower the phone was connected to, the network response time in milliseconds, and the download and upload speeds and megabits per second were all recorded. We then created lots of graphs, two hypothesis tests, and one confidence interval to create an advertisement and prove that Sprint still has some work to do. Here at Sprint, we are proud to announce that for 2016, we still suck. And we have all the descriptive statistics to back that up. Our mean tested signal strength is negative 108 decibel milliwatts. That's really pretty awful. The mean signal to noise ratio is 5.367 decibels. The mean ping time is 53.57 milliseconds. The mean download speed is 11.230 megabits per second and the mean upload speed is 5.407 megabits per second. Come to Sprint and not only cut your bill in half, but your signal and speed as well. We also calculated medians for all of these sets of data. Signal strength, negative 108 decibel milliwatts. Signal to noise ratio, similarly bad, at 4.9 decibels. Median ping, 50 milliseconds. The median download speed is 10.79 megabits per second. And the median upload speed is 5.07 megabits per second. So why should I switch? Well. The standard deviation of the signal strength is 4.09 decibel milliwatts. 4.09 is not large when considering the entire possible range of signal strengths, so variation among signal strength is small. The spread of signal strength is 14 decibel milliwatts. That means your signal will almost always be crappy. The standard deviation of the signal to noise ratio is 2.701 decibels. The spread is 10.8 decibels. The standard deviation of ping is 8.5 milliseconds. The spread is 33 milliseconds. This means variation for the signal to noise ratio and ping is quite large. The standard deviation of the download speed <clears throat> is 4.671 megabits per second. And the standard deviation of the upload speed is 3.054 megabits per second. Download and upload speeds, spreads, are 19.8 and 12.430 megabits per second respectively. So there is some variation in speeds, switch to Sprint and you get variably poor service. Since the mean and median signal strength are exactly the same, we can consider signal strength to be approximately normal. The mean signal to noise ratio, ping time, download speed, and upload speed are all greater than their median counterparts. Therefore, the shape of those data is positively skewed. Q1, Q3, and the IQR were also calculated when we created box plots which will be shown shortly. Let's take a look at the graphs to see how we stack up. As you can see here, we tested the upload and download speeds of our network for 30 consecutive days beginning on February 2nd, 2016, and we created a time series plot that summarizes our results. Download speeds were frequently higher than the upload speeds over the 30-day testing period. There were, however, some unusual spikes in download speeds in the first nine days. Expect that to be a frequent occurrence with our network. Upload speed, except for an outlier, remained fairly constant as well over the 30-day period. We also tested our network to see if our signal-to-noise ratio directly affected the download speeds. And what we found is that the equation for the best fit line is y equals 9.38 plus 0.3447x. This is the equation of the best fit line because this line yields the minimum sum of vertical deviations 
from the observed to the predicted value squared. Because the R value is 0.2, there is a weak positive linear relationship between the signal to noise ratio and download speeds. Because the R squared value is 0.04, only 4% of the variation in download speeds can be attributed to the linear relationship between the signal to noise ratio and download speeds. So even if your signal quality does increase, somehow our engineers can't figure out how to make your download speeds faster. We also tested to see if the signal to noise ratio directly affected the upload speeds on our network. We found that the equation for the best fit line is y equals 0.9712 plus 0.8266x. This is the equation of the best fit line because this line yields the minimum sum of vertical deviations from the observed to the predicted value squared. Because the R value is 0.731, there is a moderate positive linear relationship between the signal to noise ratio and upload speeds. Because the R squared value is 0.535, 53.5% of the variation in upload speed is attributed to the linear relationship between the signal to noise ratio and upload speed. So while our download speed might be terrible, you can upload all your cat videos faster than you would with most plans of Buckeye Cable System and take advantage of that unlimited data. Just don't attempt to play it back. As you can see here, we made a box plot to represent the data we collected. The upper portion focuses on download speeds. Download speed was centered at 10.79 megabits per second and shaped approximately normal. The minimum download speed was 5.27 megabits per second and the maximum was 25.1 megabits per second. The first quartile is located at 8.71 megabits per second and the third quartile is at 12.19 megabits per second. This results in the middle 50% of data being within 3.48 megabits per second also known as the inner quartile range. There are two mild outliers and one extreme outlier. Including outliers, the spread is 19.83 megabits per second, which is quite large. When outliers are excluded, the spread is 11.32 megabits per second. The lower portion of the graph focuses on upload speeds. Upload speed was centered at 5.07 megabits per second, and it shaped approximately normal. The minimum upload speed was 0.62 megabits per second, and the maximum was 13.05 megabits per second. The first quartile is located at 3.28 megabits per second, and the third quartile at 7.02 megabits per second. This results in the middle 50% of data being within 3.74 megabits per second, also known as the interquartile range. There is one mild outlier, which happens to be the maximum upload speed tested. Including the outlier, spread is 12.43 megabits per second, but excluding outliers, it was 9.61 megabits per second. These outliers sure are nice, but don't expect them in day-to-day -day use. These dot plots depict each data point for download and upload speed given each LTE band. For download speed on band 25, the mean value is 10.025 and the range is 17.08. The shape of this dot plot is positively skewed. The dot plot for band 41 has a mean value of 12.606 and a range of 19.42. The dot plot is also positively skewed. Based on the mean values, band 41 seems to be faster in terms of download speed, but band 41 has a more variable range. For upload speed on band 25, the mean value is 6.294 and its range is 11.28. The shape of this dot plot is roughly positively skewed. The dot plot for band 41 for upload speed has a mean value of 4.394 and has a range of 9.38. Its shape is approximately normal. For upload speeds, band 25 is a higher mean value than band 41, so it is faster on average. However, band 25 has a larger range, so it is more variable. This graph displays the mean upload and download speeds for each of the two tower locations tested. As one can see, when the phone was measuring download speed, speeds were much higher averaging nearly 12 megabits per second when connected to the tower at 3620 Secor Road. When connected to the tower on the University Parks Trail, download speeds were slower, averaging just under 9 megabits per second. However, the mean results differed when the phone was measuring upload speeds. Mean upload speed was nearly identical when the phone connected to either the tower at 3620 Secor Road or near the University Parks Trail at almost 6 megabits per second. Next, we constructed a 90% confidence interval 
to see if the sample download speeds recorded represent the true population proportions of download speeds. Mu is the true population mean of download speeds. We are able to assume x bar is from an SRS, and is large, which in our case is 30, and standard deviation of the population is unknown. After computing the interval, we get an interval of 9.781 to 12.679. Therefore, we are able to conclude that 90 of 100 intervals constructed in this manner will capture the true population mean download speed. We wanted to test to see if our mean download speeds equaled our mean upload speeds. Therefore, we constructed a two-sample t-test for mu. For this test, mu1 equals the true population mean download speed, and mu2 equals the true mean upload speeds. The null hypothesis is that these two values are equal to each other or that their difference equals zero. The alternate hypothesis is that these two values do not equal each other and that their difference does not equal zero. We used an alpha of 0.01 for our test. We can assume that x bar 1 and x bar 2 we selected are from independent simple random samples. Sigma 1 and sigma 2 are unknown and n1 and n2 are large. They are both greater than 30. The t value was found to be 5.714 and the degree of freedom 49. The p value was found to be approximately zero. Therefore, we have to reject the null hypothesis because there is significant evidence to suggest that the mean download speed does not equal the mean upload speed. Next, we just had to ask ourselves, is there an association between the LTE band and the tower location? For that, we conducted a chi-squared test for independence. For this test, there is nothing to define, but the null hypothesis is that the population has no association between LTE band and tower location, and the alternate hypothesis is that there would be an association. For alpha, we chose 0.01. We can assume that all observed cells are from a simple random sample. Another assumption for this type of test is that all expected cells are greater than or equal to 5, but unfortunately that assumption could not be met when we calculated our expected values. The chi-squared result is 5.249, with degree of freedom being 1. The p-value is 0.021947. Therefore, we will not reject the null hypothesis, because there is not significant evidence to suggest that there is not an association between LTE bands and tower location. So as you can see, here at Sprint, we can't make our service any worse than it already is. But we have lots of statistics that we hope will convince you to not only cut your bill in half, but the quality of your service too. We learned a lot through creating this project. We learned about cell phone technology, filming with a green screen, editing an iMovie, creating stats tests and confidence intervals, describing statistics, and working together with a difficult partner. We answered everything we sought out to answer, and we found over the, the period of 30 days, speeds were pretty constant. Our box plot and dot plot show a summary of the data we collected. We found through our chi-squared test for independence that there is an association between LTE bands and tower locations. We found through our two-sample t-test that the mean upload and download speeds are not the same. And we found that through our one-sample t-confidence interval that we can capture the mean download speed 90% of the time. In summary, we just showed descriptive statistics, a time series plot, regression graphs, a box plot, a dot plot, a one-sample t-confidence interval for mu, a two-sample t-test for mu, and a chi-squared test for independence to create a sort of reverse advertisement. We learned a lot about how all of these tests, graphs, and representations show the data we collected in different ways. And because of this class, we were able to understand how to interpret this data. So thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. You all know what to do. Like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you hated it, or leave us some comments or suggestions. Sprint on! We also tested our network to see if our signal to noise ratio directly affected the download speeds. What we found is that the equation for the best fit line is... These dot plots here predict each... Oh shoot, not, not predict, depict. <laughs> As one can see, when the phone was measuring download speed, speeds were much higher, averaging near, nearly that. We started. <laughs> Next we asked ourselves, <laughs> stop it! We can assume that all observed cells are from a simple random sample. Another assumption. Uh, <laughs> we learned a lot through creating this project. We learned about cellular.
Cellular. Cellular? <laughs> Dude, just restart, just redo it, and then you can trim that part out. Okay. We learned a lot through creating this project. We learned about cellular technology, filming with the creates. <laughs> Dude, just. <laughs> Craig. Craig, we have 10 minutes to finish this. Oh. We were rolling this whole time. Okay. Say it three times yourself. Cellular. Cellular? Cellular. That's fine. I can't laugh. I'm gonna I'm gonna like think of laughing whenever I see that word. <laughs>